Hello everybody, welcome to SCOMA Live, a brand new Welsh wildlife series all about the fantastic SCOMA Island in partnership with the Wildlife Trust of South and West Wales. My name is Lizzie Daly, I'm a biologist and broadcaster and I'm super excited about the series but it won't just be me hosting this series, I'm also joined by one of Wales's best cake eating naturalists Yolo Williams. Hello, Yolo. I'm hoping. He, I'm hoping. Hello, we'll Lizzie. You. How are you? Nice to see you. Lovely I, to I see you. Where are you? you? Uh, I'm in. Well, oddly enough, we're going to talk about Scoma, one of my favourite places in the world, and I'm in one of Wales's few landlocked counties. So I'm in. Uh, <laughs> I'm in sunny Montgomeryshire. And about all you'll hear around me is uh, bleating sheep every now and again. So <laughs> apologies for. That. Hey, we're all making it work because I'm also coming to you live from the outskirts of Cardiff, also in a field. No sheep, um, but definitely no seabirds either. But this is the point of Scone Live, right? We set up this series because right now we're all stuck at home and we've decided why not bring Scone Island to you. So just to start, for those that may not not know where Scone Island is or, or you haven't been to Scone Island, um, Scone Island is on the southwest coast of Wales in Pembrokeshire. It's uh, a few or one nautical mile from the coast of um, a place called uh, well, Pembrokeshire, but Martin's Haven. And it is a wonderful island. It's one of the largest islands in Pembrokeshire. It's about 720 acres. Um, and it's absolutely right now full of life. This island has been a, a nature reserve since 1950. Um, there's seabirds coming back right now to breed. It's managed by the Wildlife Trust of South and West Wales. It's paradise. Yeah, it is paradise. Do you know, I've always said that uh, of all the reserves we've got in Wales, the one, I think above all others, that can hold its head up with anything anywhere in the world, whether it's the Amazon River, in forest or whether it's Great Barrier Reef, I think it's Scormer Island. You know, you've got over well over half a million seabirds on there every spring and summer. It's just an amazing place. And it's nice. Hopefully, it's going to be nice to show people Scormer. So many people want to go out there. So many people can't at the moment, of course. So hopefully we can bring a little bit of Scormer into these people's lives. And what have we got coming up for you? Well, we've got we'll be going through spring, of course, and hopefully into summer as well. We'll be looking at um, the the um, breeding biology of a lot of the wildlife then, not not just the birds, but hopefully bringing some reptiles, some amphibians, some some of the botany there. And with a bit of luck, we mustn't forget Scorma is also a marine nature reserve, so we hopefully we'll be bringing in uh, some of the marine life. And we'll be talking to this crew, the crew of fantastic wardens and specialists out there on the island. Talking to the wardens every week and bringing in specialists every now and again to talk about the research that's going on. But we also want you at home to get involved as well. Um, have you got any questions? Please send those in to us, not just to Lizzie and myself. We can answer a few, but uh, far better if we ask the wardens, we ask the specialists, they, they're going to know all the answers. And photos too. I was looking through some of my old photos the other day, and I came across some photos of me on Scoma probably about 15 years ago now with my two boys when they were a little tuts so I'll, I'll send those in next week and if you've got any photos not just of you and the family but some of the wildlife there please send them in with tag for live on them absolutely um were you rocking any any lovely ha haircuts back then yola oh? <laughs> no i i haven't got any looking forward to that now, Lizzie, so, so any haircut was better than this <laughs> Exactly. So, um, yeah, please do get in touch. We'd love, love to see your photos. And and uh, actually, there's there's a lot of stories about Scoma Island. You know, when when I first started learning about Scoma and, and how brilliant it is, also really interesting in terms of this geology and this history as well. Scoma Island was formed about 12,000 years ago after the last ice age. When the sea levels rose, it became separated from the mainland. Actually, if you're going around Scoma Island, there's a number of significant places, not just for wildlife, but for ruins and things as well. So feel free to get your questions in about the geology, history, wildlife, whatever. However, in addition to questions, we also want you to help us shape the show. So we're going to put out a bit of a poll. Now, Yolo absolutely mentioned that there's not just there, there's lots of other life there as 
well. And we want you to vote on what we're going to see. The options are slow. There's a really fantastic amount of this with the slow worms, which of course aren't snakes. They're actually legless lizards. I'm sure a lot of you know that watching. There, there's option B, yellow. Sorry to say it's puffin. Everyone loves a puffin, let's be honest. <laughs> Charismatic orc. Um, and then option C, uh, we've got the scoma vole. Now, many of you may not know that the scoma vole is an endemic subspecies of bank vole only found on scoma. How brilliant is that? So get your votes in now. And at the end of this live, we will have your votes in. And that's the animal that we will feature in next week's show. Enough of me for now. Um, we're actually now going to hopefully, if technology allows, head over to scoma island itself to meet all the fantastic team on the island as well as the head warden nathan and sylvia nathan and sylvia are you there hello Ooh, hello i hope we, you can hear as well hello this is oh, my team. You sound fabulous. hello how are Hiya. you all today good great. good great mood <laughs> just as sunny yeah, here yeah, as it is for you guys by looks it yeah. What's happening on the island right now? What's going on? Well, plenty actually. So of course we're a bit, it still feels slightly odd with having no visitors on the island. Um, it almost feels as if it was still March, even though we're like well into April, everything is kicking off. The, the flowers are blooming coming into bloom the seabirds are all crazy uh, cover covering the entire yeah. island so it's exciting it's, it's really exciting everything is really lively and and we're really enjoying the time here so this year we arrived on the 6th of march a, about a week later than usual um we were delayed by bad weather um at that point just about still expecting potentially a normal season um, but it soon became apparent that it was going to be quite different to usual with a lot less um, other faces that we'll see. So there's just the five of us on the island. As of the 1st of April, we would have been expecting to see up to 250 people a day visiting the island and up to 16 guests staying in the hostel. So we prepped all of the island. We made sure that uh, the hostel was looking very nice for all of the guests that we were expecting to arrive. Uh, the team, especially the guys behind us, uh, did fantastic work with that. Um, but now the, the plan changed, as, as plans often do. And um, yeah, I haven't welcomed the field workers onto the island that we were expecting. Uh, so usually there's around 15 people within the team. So we also have six weekly volunteers come onto the island that help us with the day visitors and the hostel guest work especially, but also some of the monitoring as well. And usually three field workers doing um, productivity monitoring or, and um, adult survival as well. And usually uh, lots of world leading researchers as well. So it's a shame not to be seeing them uh, this year, um, so far at least. Yeah, I must say we are very fortunate that we are able to carry on working on the island. And, and obviously the, the reason why is because we're isolated already. Uh, and, and we really regret that we can't welcome anyone on the island, uh, but it's just, just just how it is and we have to accept it for now. Hopefully soon that's going to change and um, we're very hopeful. Um, and yeah, so we're now going to focus on, on what normally happens on the island. So uh, breeding bird surveys and um, seabird monitoring um, and carry on with a little bit of maintenance still. So everything is nice and ready for when we reopen the island. Um, but before we go into details, perhaps we should maybe introduce ourselves better, uh, especially the guys behind us. So um, we wanted to, everyone to know who, who, who is who. Um, so I'm Sylvia, actually, so one of the wardens. Um, the previous island was the Calf of Man. That was just at the beginning of uh, 2018. And this is now my first, well, third season on the island, but the second full season. Uh, and on to Nathan. <laughs> so I'm Nathan. Um, my hometown is Dover. Um, also before this, I was on the Calf of Man. Um, I've also worked on the Farn Islands, um, volunteered out in the Outer Hebrides on Mingile, um, in Cyprus doing bird surveys there. So I've been very lucky in my career, but fantastic to be on SCOMA and into our 
third year, but second full year here on SCOMA. Uh, I'm Karis. Uh, I'm assistant warden this year on SCOMA. Uh, I Previously, I was in Scotland at St Abbs Head and before that Lindisfarne, where I sort of started out volunteer, then apprentice. And uh, and yeah, it's uh, it's incredible to be working on, on my first first island, Seabird Island, and uh, what a place to be. Hey, I'm Catherine. I grew up in South Wales and so Pembrokeshire has always had um, so many happy memories for me. We used to spend a lot of summers down here, so it's an absolute dream now to work here on the island. Um, having done a master's in marine conservation, I went to study Manx waters in the Faroe Islands. Um, and it's a smaller population than the one we've got here. So it's so fantastic to be here now. And I'm visitor officer on the island, but uh, my role is obviously changed <laughs> to much more monitoring of species now, um, which is super exciting for me. But Look forward to hopefully welcoming visitors again soon. I'm Rianne. I'm a long term volunteer here. Um, I recently completed a master's in marine biology in Cork in Ireland. And since finishing that, I was working at an aquarium and now I'm here. Um, so helping out with the maintenance and the monitoring as best as I can. It will be able to have these guys here with us. Um, it, it's been working really well. I mean, we are we are a small team, but we're we're close and we, we, we communicate. We have lots of fun and we go out there, do a lot of field work and and we've been having a really, really good time. And hopefully, hopefully everyone agrees with me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so some of the things that we've done. Oh, wonderful guys. <laughs> I've I've got one question to ask all of you. Have you got room for one more warden out there? <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to ask these guys. Are you volunteering? <laughs> I am, yeah, definitely. At the moment, yeah, I do anything to get out there. I'll I'll even bring cake. Well, oh, yes. great. <laughs> we oh, cake and oh. an Indian takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> all right, shall we get back to work? Yeah. So we'll these guys are going to see you. Lovely to see you. See you. Lovely to meet you all, and uh, thank you all to the team there. Nathan and Sylvia will be joining us again uh, shortly, answering some of your questions in a little while. But isn't it amazing, Yolo, to put all the names and the faces to the people that are making life on island continue as normal while we're not there? Yeah, it, it is, and actually, just seeing that small part of the island, you know, makes me homesick for it again because I spent I spent 15 years working for the RSPB and going go for two weeks every year onto school to help I'm honest I, I really miss it especially in where so, yeah good, absolutely. good luck to there. absolutely and we'll be following up with the team every single week every Wednesday at 12 p.m and um, touching base learning more about the monitoring projects and just seeing what's going on on the island now very excitingly last Friday the wildlife trust of south and west wales set up a brand new live cam and one camera but it's multiple live cameras across scoma island to bring the wildlife day and night right so since starting this as what happens in live is it all goes a little bit wrong and uh what we had before was a lovely two ledges of gill there out of you should be able to see it on the screen a lovely view of the whole of the side of scoma and a, a little bit of the water there as well and i'm just trying to make out if i can see any seabirds there but to be honest yolo it looks it looks very much like a guillemot's home those steep ledges where they they kind of nest so uh, talk to me oh here we go we're actually zooming in right yeah. now on the live Lovely. cameras into those steep ledges <laughs> Yeah, Yolo, it's it's quite um they're quite a god they're beautiful orc, aren't they? But nesting on those um those steep ledges, it seems very precarious. <laughs> yeah, well, you'd you'd think so, wouldn't you? But they but they're packed in tightly on there, you know, not, not just hundreds, but sometimes thousands of them. And there's an advantage to that because they've got marauding gulls all around trying to get in, trying to get up the the one egg that they've laid or the, the one chick when that eventually hatches. But of course, if they, they've got their backs 
to the outside to give the, the egg as much warmth, as much protection as they possibly can. When a gull comes past, the heads all turn outwards and you've got an army of beaks pointing out. So the fact that they tighten on that ledge, yeah, in a way it's quite dangerous. You've not got much room for manoeuvre on there, but it does make it easier when you're those mass ranks. It makes it a lot easier to protect your precious egg, precious chick from marauding gulls. So, yeah, it, in, in one way, it's maybe not perfect, but in, in another way, it works pretty well for all those guillemots. And if you're one guillemot in amongst a thousand, you're much safer than if you're one guillemot out there just by yourself. If you're going to get then. The research on SCOMA has been going on for more than five decades now. Wow. Wow. It's, uh, and we've got scenes right now on the live camera that's perfectly timed of guillemots on just what looks like this really it's so steep the the cliffs that they do actually nest in well, I, I say nest they don't really have any materials for their nest at all but it creates this big kind of white shimmy rock and um i was reading up on of course professor tim burkhead's research uh on the guillemot egg that beautiful striking turquoise spotted egg that a guillemot lays it's absolutely stunning but i was reading about uh, his research and theories of their shaped in that kind of end Oh, gosh, I tell you what, I, being a guillemot chick is not for me, Yolo, at all. Not only is it kind of, seems like during the time where the egg is on the cliff, it's a case of hopefully this egg will survive. But actually, when you've got a fledge, it's a whole new drama. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, it is. And, and, and I mean, that's one of the things we, we're hoping to see if we can over the next few weeks, over the next couple of months or so, of course is that when they fled, they, for quite a, they jump, they call them jumpers. All at once, over the period of a few days, those chicks will jump off that cliff in, into the sea, coaxed down by the male, just the male, and he will then lead that chick out to the open sea, which at that point is the safest place. Because if you stay on that island, you run the gauntlet of, you know, your herring girl, your lesser black, Black gull, your great black back gull, all of these predators are waiting because you'd make a fine morsel for those birds. Whereas if you can sneak away under the cover of darkness out onto the open sea, you're going to be much, much safer. And it, it'd be lovely if we're on there to see those jumpers because it's an amazing thing. Absolutely incredible. And yeah, you, you would be very lucky to see it in numerous places in Cardigan Bay and Bempton Cliff. Here on Scoma, in the dawn and the dusk times, when when they are most likely to fledge, and it's really interesting because when they do fledge, often you're there one day, a cliff full of guillemots, and then the next, it could be absolutely empty. So it's a really fascinating mm. and pretty epic uh, start to life for a guillemot chick. So um, do keep on top of those live cameras because they'll be going day and night, um, bringing you all the best wildlife action live to you. Now, Yolo, you mentioned the great black black gull seems to have uh, played a little bit of a theme recently for Skoma Island uh, as there was a video that was posted by the team just a few weeks ago which ended up going a little bit viral uh, to tell you more about it it's Nathan and Sylvia here is a clip of what happened rabbits were introduced to the UK in the 12th century by the Romans or the Normans depending on which version of history you believe and it didn't take long for them to be brought to islands like Skoma because this is a safe way to protect rabbits from ground predators and also raiding humans. Rabbits were farmed for their meat but also their fur and in more recent years as pets. And this is why you can see lots of different coloured rabbits on Skoma. Rabbits remain safe from ground predators on Skoma to this day and that's why there's still a plentiful bounty for great blackback gulls. Great blackback gulls are one of the top predators on Skomer Island and they are a very intelligent species. So this video shows a very interesting behavior. In fact, it's one of the many learned behaviors spread by great blackback gulls. The behavior involves waiting patiently for long hours, sometimes even a day, at the rabbit burrow or often at seabird burrows like puffins. Rabbits seemingly get used to the great blackback gulls' presence and after a very long time of waiting, 
they'll poke their head out and that's when the great blood bag gall pounces. Another very interesting behavior that they exhibit is hunting at night. Great blood bag gulls are going to come out at twilight and it often feels as if they were hunting throughout the entire night when the sky is lit with a full moon. You'll often observe great blood bag gulls exhibit kleptoparasitism, which means that they're going to harass and some other smaller seabirds to encourage them to drop the prey that they're carrying to feed their young in a nest or in a burrow. Great blackbacks are reasonably stable on SCOMA with 108 pairs breeding last year. Last year was also a very successful year in terms of breeding success with two chicks on average fledging per nest. Personally, great blubber gulls are my favourite seabird on this island, well, together with storm petrels. And now back to Lizzie and Yellow. Oh, wow, what an amazing clip that is. And that explains why the Easter Bunny didn't come to my house this Easter. It's uh, it's down the gullet <laughs> of a great black bat girl. But, but it just goes to show, you know, great black bat girl, the top of that food chain out on Skoma. They're impressive beasts. They really are. They're about the size of a buzzard, longer winged. So they're big, big things. And on Skoma, I've seen them swallow rabbits whole. I've seen them swallow um, puffins whole. You know, there's there's virtually nothing out there that isn't too big for a, a great black bat gull. And, and some people say, oh, that's brutal. What you, what you have to remember is that the gull also needs to lay eggs, needs to rear its young, you know. So, and, and there is a balance. They've not got that many pairs out there. I can't remember exactly how many, but it's it's not many. So they're never going to decimate the, the population of rabbits or puffins or whatever it is. They're just going to eat enough to rear their young but yeah that that's that's an an amazing clip and you can see why that's gone viral absolutely and i mean the one thing that i think of when looking at that is how on earth does an animal like a gull then try and digest all that food and actually um birds are, they're very good at this right because they don't have teeth to chew up all of their food and everything about their internal system is designed to break down all of those bones and all those necessary parts so they have two compartments in their stomach one's called the muscular compartment uh, known as the gizzard and that will really help break down the bones into smaller fragments and then there's a, a glandular compartment which is, which will break that down further and dissolve all those bones and it's just I mean, I don't know how long it would take to get that out the other end, Yolo, but um, I'm sure it'd be a, a while, but they're very well adapted uh, for it. Just an amazing, amazing clip. Um, OK, so I think it's time for questions. Should we head over back to Sylvia and Nathan on the island? We've had a few questions uh, coming in. So um, I'm just going to read out a few comments. We've got lovely feedback. Hermione says hello. She sails into SCOMA every year. Um, and perhaps we'll, we'll put this first question over to the SCOMA wardens. Laura asks, what's the most impressive cetacean around SCOMA? Well, we often see harbour porpoise, which is always nice to see. Um, but it's fantastic seeing common dolphin especially. Um, we have our own small boat and sometimes when we're going to pick up some food or maybe some gas cylinders, you might have common dolphin bow riding on our boat and you can see them within a few feet. It's, it's fantastic. Occasionally we get bottle nose dolphin as well. But even less oh, likely than that, we might see minke whale. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I've, I've seen lots of the porpoise around that turbulent water around Skoma Island. Um, a few more comments. Les says, incredible experience when he visited last year. Anita was on Skoma last year when the Blue Belt and Red Campion were out together. Yeah. She says it was an amazing sight. A question for you, Yolo. Uh, Chris asks, what's your favourite seabird? Oh, wow. That is a good question. My favourite seabird. Well, um, as somebody said, if I mention puffling, that they would donate 20 pounds to the NHS. So if I say puffling, 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 that's 100 pounds <laughs> to the NHS gone. Uh, my favourite seabird. Um, I, do you know what? I think it would have to be the Manx Shearwater, I think. You know, Skoma is the best place on earth for them. Um, and Wales holds somewhere nearing two thirds of the world population. And they, I, I mean, we, we'll get into Manxies later on, I'm sure. But their, their life cycle is just incredible. So 
I would have to say amongst stew water. Wonderful. Um, just a few, we're, we're running out of time. Katie Price was a voluntary assistant warden on the island in 1989. How fabulous is that? And honestly, so many people just wishing they could self-isolate with you guys on SCOMA uh, like you guys are warden. So um, I think we're, we're pretty much running out of time. So we're just going to say a big goodbye and a thank you to you both. We're very much looking forward to, to dropping in with you next week. Wonderful. We're very excited as well and can't wait. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, both. See you later. OK, and um, Yolo, you'll be glad to know the poll results are in. Are you ready for this? I am, yeah. Go on. Who it's won? What are we looking at next week? <laughs> Cake. Uh, it's Puffins. It's Puffins. It's uh, puffins. <laughs> I wanted slow worms to win. Come on, people. <laughs> Yeah, we had 49% uh, puffins, 36% scoma voles, getting scoma voles, and then 15% uh, for our slow worms. Oh, oh well. Uh, but we'll be coming back to them <laughs> later on down the line, um, I'm sure. So, yeah, I mean, Yolo, what a fantastic series. Hey, this is going to be a really exciting few weeks. Yeah, it, do you know what, Lizzie? It, it is, you know, even I've been over the scoma dozens of times. I'm really excited to watch from afar as things develop week on week on week because at the moment the birds they're all going to be incubating and then of course they're going to hatch and they're going to be back and forth it's going to get busier and busier and busier so yeah i'm really looking forward to the next few weeks me too i think the sheer waters definitely with those live cams will be able to well the next week i'm going to be on that live cam trying to find some interesting fun behaviours for, for next week. So maybe we can get, get a bit of sheer water action in there as well. And just for all of you watching at home, thank you for tuning in. Just a quick note to say that, you know, this is, for me and Yolo, this is just absolutely great because we get to talk about somewhere we're really panicked about. But there's another arm to this because right now the wardens and the wildlife trusts of South and West Wales are working so hard to make sure that they're continuing to conserve the wildlife, to protect the islands, um, so in the banner at the bottom, you will have seen a, a donate page where you can support the work of these fantastic people on the Wildlife Trust. So do go and support them. And um, we really hope you enjoyed this series. We'll be back next week, Wednesday, 12 p.m. Yolo, I'll see you there. Bring cake. I, I will. I did mean to bring cake this time, so apologies for that. But there will be cake next week. Don't worry. And you can all watch me eating it at the end as well. But thanks, everyone, for watching. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs>